Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm going to be talking about something that's been annoying me a little bit, uh, especially recently with all the coverage around the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Jutland, uh, the largest uh, dreadnought engagement in history and one of the largest surface naval engagements of all time. Um, but first, real quick, I've returned to Atlantic Fleet. You can obviously see that uh, we've picked up our Let's Play where we left off. And um, I'm just using this mainly because I have the footage available to uh, voice over uh, something that I've wanted to talk about for a little bit and uh, would like to go into a little bit more detail than perhaps I, I normally do. So the uh, Atlantic Fleet footage I figured was fitting given... It's about, you know, mainly surface naval engagement. I know it, purpo it purports, purports, purports uh, to be a, um, you know, a Atlantic uh, Battle of the Atlantic simulator, but in reality it's more of a uh, surface naval simulator uh, with submarine elements. Anyway, uh, the topic I wanted to talk about today is the plight of the battle cruiser in the kind of 100th anniversary uh discussion about the Battle of Jutland, which occurred on May 31st and into the early morning hours of June 1st of 1916. Uh, there's often this uh, commonly accepted judgment that the battle cruiser was a fundamentally flawed concept. Uh, the argument usually takes the uh, results of the Battle of Jutland, as well as the later engagement for HMS Hood, uh, to claim that the battle cruiser was too heavily armed and too lightly armored. Uh, this combination of big gun and limited armor ensured the ship would be used to fight other heavily armored ships, uh, such as battleships. And without the heavy armor of a battleship, uh, the battleship armament, uh, the 15-inch or 14-inch guns, combined with the very limited armor plating on the ship, ensured that it would be at a serious disadvantage any time it fought a capital ship, which is true. Uh, but basically, the argument is saying that, hey, listen, you've got this really heavily armored ship, and these admirals don't know how to use it. They're going to put it toe-to-toe -to -toe with other really heavily armored or, or armament ships. I, don't, I know I'm mixing up armor and armament, but basically, you're taking these ships with really big guns, but very little shielding. And you're going to put them on, up against other ships with really big guns, but adequate shielding. Uh, that's the argument behind the Dreadnought. And, again, people usually use the argument that, hey, listen, at Jutland, three battlecruisers blew up, which is definitely true. Um, and, uh, you know, that obviously proves that these ships never should have been in the line of battle. Uh, additionally, the German battlecruiser Lützow uh, sunk shortly after the fighting at Jutland had ended. It was part of the Battle of Jutland, uh, and it was another battlecruiser that sank. In fact, no dreadnought warships were sunk as a result of surface combat uh, during the Battle of Jutland. The greatest surface naval engagement of all time, and not a single heavily armored ship was sunk. It was only the battlecruisers. This ignores a few things about the Battle of Jutland, such as the fact that the vast majority of the actual firing was occurring between the battle cruisers and the other side's battle cruisers. And to a limited extent, uh, there was uh, dreadnought battleships engaged British battle cruisers, uh, German dreadnoughts, and the British dreadnoughts really only had a brief, uh, a brief, you know, handful of minutes, handful of salvos, uh, where the surface fleet engaged uh, the Germans. So, despite the argument that, you know, oh, well, obviously the battle cruisers are a flawed concept, they're being used against other battleships, they really weren't. Um, not really. Um, and as soon as they ran into the enemy battle lines, both the British and the Germans uh, withdrew as quickly as they could, um, for the most part. And I know I'm ignoring the Queen Elizabeths, which were used alongside the battle cruisers, uh, which performed r remarkably well. Uh, but I will get into that as well. Uh, throughout this this video. Um, additionally, not just uh, the First World War, but the HMS Hood, which was a battle cruiser in concept, uh, engaged the Bismarck in World War II, and the argument goes that, well, because it was a battle cruiser, it had no hope against the Bismarck, uh, and it quickly went up in smoke, uh, just as the battle cruisers at Jutland did. 
Additionally, sometimes people like to lump in the fate of the HMS Renowned, uh, which was a battle cruiser which was sunk uh, alongside the, I want to say it was the Renowned. Yeah, it was the Renowned, right? Renowned and the King George V, uh, which were both sunk in uh, the Pacific Theater against the Japanese. Although that ignores the fact that the Japanese were attacking with air units and that the Queen, uh, Queen, the King George V, uh, was a heavily armored traditional dreadnought type of battleship, and it was also sunk by air units. Um, the sinking of the Renown had almost nothing to do with any flawed armored concepts, uh, but rather flawed tactics, which led the ship uh, into the path of hundreds of Japanese uh, level bombers carrying torpedoes. Um, so, you know, sometimes when you when you get when you get looking at the battle cruiser, you can fall into this easy narrative to say, uh, sure, sure, John Fisher, the you know, the mastermind behind the a battle cruiser obviously had a flawed concept here in that, you know, tons of money was wasted on these ships that never should have been wasted. You know, this money should have gone into traditional battleships or more traditional light cruisers, and the battle cruiser just didn't have a purpose. That's an easy argument to make when you look at World War One and you say, okay, well, all the major capital ships, I think with one exception, uh, that were sunk were battle cruisers. And only one of the battle cruisers, I want to say, in World War II uh, that went into the war survived, uh, as opposed to the majority of the battleships. But again, that ignores the way these ships were being used, and that ignores the circumstances of their destruction. So, you know, as you can guess from this, this, uh, this video, I, I categorically disagree with this evaluation that the battle cruiser was a flawed concept. In my mind, uh, the battle cruiser was in fact a sound design with a clear purpose, and while perhaps overpriced for its, its mission, I don't think you can argue against that, it was not a flawed design or concept, so long as you wanted to spend what they cost on the roll. Uh, the battle cruiser only had a short lifespan before technology rendered its usefulness obsolete, uh, as battleships, traditional battleships, increased in speed uh, and became just as quick as the battle cruiser. Uh, the utility of the battle cruiser uh, quickly vanished. There was maybe a 10 to 15 year period from about 1908 to the mid 1920s where the battle cruiser was really a sound and useful design. Um, and that in of itself may be the biggest damning uh, critique of the class is that it was, uh, it was a momentary period in time where this type of design made sense. Uh, and afterwards, once technology increase the uh, propulsion power of turbines so that very heavily armored ships uh, with large guns could go just as fast or almost as fast as uh, lesser armed ships um, or lesser armored ships um, then you you know you're already obsolete half the time you know you only have a handful of battle cruisers that can be built before the whole concept is obsolete but with that exception you know, with with that understanding uh, that for a brief 15 period of time, the battle cruiser uh, was useful. During that period of time, it did its job admirably. Uh, its shortcomings were more related to the ships suffering a uh, breakdown in safety procedures or pro protocols, uh, in large part due to the pressures placed upon its crews to increase the rate of fire at all costs on the British side, um, rather than any design flaws. First, however, before we get too in-depth to the discussion of why the battle cruiser was in fact a sound design, I think we need to take a look back at the history of the battle cruiser. Where did it come from? What was the battle cruiser? What inspired the battle cruiser? Well, despite the name, you know, the name battle cruiser would make you think, oh my goodness, this is a battleship, but, you know, a different take on it. In reality, the battle cruiser was actually just a further development of the armored cruiser concept, which almost no one questions its utility. Uh, rather than a splinter off the battleship tree, so it's not you know it's not something that broke off the tree of battleship design and technology and thought. It was something that was uh, a evolution of an existing class of ships, which uh, often escapes much criticism. You know, it's widely agreed that armored cruisers were more or less obsolete by the time World War One came around. Uh, but it's not something where people are like, oh my goodness, why did anyone ever build armored cruisers? That's a crazy design. So really, the battle cruiser was a splinter off of the armored cruiser concept. 
Um, now, what's the armored cruiser going to say? We could keep going back a long way back into history to kind of find the impetus for the battle cruiser. But in short, the armored cruiser concept uh, was originated in 1873 uh, when it was decided that large cruisers, which are basically the follow-ons to the frigate, so, you know, in the age of sail, uh, you had this sort of a rating system where a first rate would be a capital warship, uh, would generally be the flagship of the fleet. HMS Victory was a first rate ship, you know, 100 guns. Second rates would be, you know, 80 to 90 guns. Third rates would be 74 guns. Fourth rates would be 50 to 64 guns. And then fifth rates would typically be in the upper 20s to, to very low 40s in terms of the number of guns. So these rates were decided largely by firepower. Not so much, you know, size, although that obviously factored into it. You know, the bigger, the more guns you have, the bigger the ship. But really, it was des- it was factored into the number of guns and the hitting power you had. And the cruiser uh, really originates from sort of the 4th, 5th, and maybe a little bit further down, you know, 6th rate ships. Um, so the frigate. You know, you think of Napoleonic warfare, you think of the frigate, you know, the fast, nimble warship designed for independent, far-off stations away from the battle line. And the third rate was kind of where the battleship would be would be factored in. The, the first, second, and third rate, you know, battleships kind of consolidated that all into one. Um, whereas the cruiser would be the fourth or the fifth rate, or sometimes maybe the sixth rate if it was like a light-protected cruiser. So the cruiser's main purpose was to be, at least in theory, uh, the the cruiser had a couple of roles. So one role would be scouting. You know, you'd be a quick ship, you can get out in front of the fleet, you can find the enemy, you can report back. And that's the same role that the frigate had. Uh, The cruiser also had the role of showing the flag overseas. Battleships are big and expensive machines that are very difficult to maintain in far-flung reaches of the world. But a cruiser, because of its size and its extended range, could serve as a colonial flagship. So the idea was, you know, you have these far-off stations and you've got this big cruiser that would kind of be the flagship. It would be more powerful and faster uh, than pretty much anything. Maybe not faster, but certainly more powerful than anything it would meet in a distant station, you know, off in India or off in uh, in Asia. Uh, But if it ran into a battleship, it would be fast enough to escape. So basically you have these kind of distant station warships. Sometimes they might be used for commerce raiding. Theoretically they could be used for scouting. Uh, They'd be quick enough to get away, heavily armored enough to deal with anything smaller than them. And that's kind of the cruiser concept. And the armored cruiser was an evolution on this. It was, you know, the largest of the cruisers, so the fifth or the fourth rates, um, the biggest guns, but still fast enough to escape from a battleship. Uh, But the idea was, okay, well, with... With firepower advancing, you know, the 1870s, now you're seeing explosive shells become more and more common. You're seeing new developments in technology, basically saying that a simple armor, you know, a simple iron deck or a wooden warship is not sufficient. We need an armor belt, you know, in the vein of of the, the battleships of the time. So cruisers began to have an armored belt, and that's why they were called armored cruisers. Protected cruisers, I believe, came a little bit later. Uh, A protected cruiser was somewhere in between, like a completely unarmored or scout cruiser and an armored cruiser where they'd have limited armor over vital parts of the ship. An armored cruiser, in theory, would have an armor belt across the entire ship, just like a battleship would, but at a lower level. So you wouldn't have, you know, 10 or 12 inches of armor, you might only have 5 or 6. Meanwhile, the armored cruiser wouldn't have the same firepower as a battleship. It would have, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10-inch guns, whereas a battleship would usually have 11 or 12-inch guns. Although not always true, especially in the case of the Germans. So that's the concept of the armored cruiser. Is it's this warship designed for far-off, distant stations. It would be more economical to operate in distant stations, uh, more affordable, but strong enough to deal with anything it might come across. That's sort of the high-level concept. And then, you know, in the 1880s, the French and the Russians began building even bigger armored cruisers with the idea of using them as as commerce raiders. You know, they're faster than battleships, and they're so far out, there's no way the British are going to deploy their battle fleet into the middle of nowhere. But these ships are going to have really long ranges with good-sized guns and good armor so that they can just devastate British trade. 
And so the British began developing a counter to that, which were just as large, if not larger, armored cruisers with heavier guns um, and long range. So over time, from the 1870s all the way to 1908, each iteration of armored cruiser, it seemed, got bigger and bigger, in some cases faster, but it seemed like that sort of 22 to 23 knot speed was kind of typical. Uh, it was fast enough to avoid the slow lumbering pre-dreadnought battleships, but um, you know, slow that it wouldn't be able to compete with destroyers or things like that. It would have very long range, and it increasingly had larger and larger guns, because as the French and the Russians and the Germans all began developing you know, these cruisers with this concept of we could use these for cruiser warfare, um, the British said, well, we've, we need bigger and bigger guns to deal with these ships because we're not going to be able to get our battleships all the way out there. And, uh, you know, we need to make sure these armored cruisers really can deal with anything they might run across. So as a result, the 40 years between the, uh, well, really 35 years between the development of the armored cruiser and the battle cruiser, you saw armored cruisers get bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time the battle cruiser was about to come around, the distinction between armored cruiser and battleship was blurring. There was really no point, with maybe the exception of the American uh, frigates, uh, the, the really fourth-rate, superbly designed frigates of the you know, USS Constitution, um, Chesapeake was one of them, I believe, sort of those six famous American frigates. Outside of those, and even they wouldn't be able to stand up against a British third rate. But outside of those, there really was never a time where you thought maybe an armored cruiser could, you know, or maybe a, maybe a frigate, sorry, maybe a frigate could stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with HMS Victory and, and win. But in the case of the armored cruiser, that began to be called into question. There were advocates, uh, John Fisher being one of them, the head of the British Admiralty, that said maybe we should just replace battleships altogether with these cruisers. Cruisers were becoming more and more expensive. They were becoming almost as expensive as battleships. Thus, before the battle cruiser even existed, the line between battleship and cruiser was becoming blurred. Just to illustrate this, let's take a look at a few examples. The German Scharnhorst class, Germany's well, I'd say last armored cruiser class, but that's not really true, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But Germany's Scharnhorst class of the fame under uh, von Spee and the uh, Asiatic fleet displaced roughly 13,000 tons. So it's a 13,000 ton armored cruiser, and it mounted eight 8.3 inch main guns. They gave it a throw weight for its main broadside weight of about 1,900 tons, or 1,900 pounds. So the total weight of the shells it would fling out at an enemy would be about 1,900 pounds. Meanwhile, the German battleship class that was designed at the same time as the Scharnhorst, the Deutschland class, Germany's last pre-dreadnought battleship class, only displaced about, and I'm, I'm using rough approximations, I know, you know, if it's heavily loaded for bear versus standard displacement, you know, there's some differences there. But the German Deutschland class, pre dreadnought, only displaced about 14,000 tons. So an armored cruiser in the Scharnhorst class and the Deutschland class were only off by about 1,000 tons. Now, a lot of that, you know, would be machinery. These ships are designed for more far-off stations. So, you know, the German battleships were more designed for close-in, you know, very different designs. But in terms of actual raw displacement and size of the ships, at a distance, it'd be difficult to tell just from a size, not from a silhouette or anything, but just from a size, it'd be very difficult to tell the difference. Additionally, the Deutschland uh, had four 11-inch main battery guns, each gun had about a 600-pound warhead that gave it about a 2,500-pound uh, main battery broadside when you compare that with the 1,900 pounds of the Scharnhorst class. It's a pretty sizable difference, but when you actually look at it, the difference between the Scharnhorst and the uh, Deutschland class in terms of the actual weight of broadside would only be one single 11-inch shell. Just a single one. Now, granted, there's only four, so that's a, you know, it's a pretty noticeable difference, but still, it's tempting enough to say, hey, these two ships maybe could go toe-to-toe, -to -toe. and the biggest thing that would kind of prevent you from being able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe would be uh, the range. So the 
you know, the Scharnhorst only has 8.3 inch guns versus an 11 inch gun. The 11 inch gun can fire from a much greater distance, uh, and therefore it would, um, you know, would be able to take out the cruiser before it got into range. But that's, that's on the German side. So, you know, it's a difference. Certainly the caliber of shell matters. But on the whole, on the surface, these two ships are not terribly dissimilar. One is certainly more powerful than the, than the other. But, you know, it, it could be tempting to say if one's slightly cheaper than the other, which, which tended not to really be the case, but if one's slightly cheaper than the other, it might make sense to, um, to go with an all-cruiser concept. Let's take a look at the British, you know, another good example. So the last British armored cruiser was the Duke of Edinburgh class. Similar to the Scharnhorst, it, displayed, it displaced about 13,000 tons. Um, unlike the Scharnhorst, it mounted 9.2-inch main guns, six of them. Uh, when you compare that to its contemporary battleship, I don't take the last British pre-dreadnoughts. I look at the Edward VII class, because that's about the same time frame as the Edinburgh. So the Edward VII class pre-dreadnoughts, uh, displaced about 16,000 tons, so a bigger difference than the Deutschland and the Scharnhorst had between each other. It's certainly, you know, a heavier ship, and mounted four 12-inch guns, but in addition to that, it did also mount four 9.2-inch secondaries, which I bring up only because they're the same size as the main armament on the armored cruiser. So, you know, it gives it a substantial edge, uh, thanks to that kind of uh, mixed battery in terms of its broadside weight. So that's fair. Okay, the British armored cruiser is definitely at a disadvantage versus the uh, British battleship. However, the Edinburgh's broadsides were actually heavier uh, than many of the German battleships that might face off against the British in a hypothetical war. So it's nice to compare the British to themselves, but the fact is you're not going to fight yourself. Uh, so if we actually compare the Edinburgh to uh, the Wittelsbach, uh, class battleship, which was made only about four years before the Edinburgh class uh, was made. Um, the Edinburgh is actually heavier. It's a larger ship. And it has a bigger weight of broadside. The German Wittelbach had a relatively small main armament of only 9.4-inch guns, I believe, and it had four of them. The British had six 9.2-inch guns. So it actually had a heavier broadside, and it was a larger warship. So, again, there's that blurring of the line between armored cruiser and battleship uh, at this time frame. Because, again, you know, if you look at the ships, if you compare the newest armored cruiser versus the newest battleship, as I've done, in most cases the battleship is going to be a little bit more powerful, a little bit heavier, um, and have a, a noticeable difference in armament. However, um, it's not going to be so big that, you know, the preceding classes would not necessarily... Uh, outstrip the armored cruiser of the same time frame. So you could easily see an admiral being like, well, listen, you know, I know this uh, Edinburgh is not going to face off against an Edward VII all that favorably, but it might against a Wittelsbach. And in a surface engagement of 20 to 30 battleships that are going off against each other, the temptation exists to say, all right, well, let's just throw these guys into the line of battle. You know, they're comparable enough, and they'll certainly add some firepower. Um, so why wouldn't we use them for this? You know, we can use them for scouting. They're faster than the battleships. They can kind of sail around and tell us where the enemy is. And then when the battle's joined, we'll put them on either end of our battle line. And they'll, you know, they'll help prevent the enemy from flanking our slower, more vulnerable battleships. And they'll still pack a punch and, and be useful in a surface engagement. And that is exactly how the battle cruiser was used in World War I. I don't say in World War II, because by the time World War II was around, there weren't enough battle cruisers still in surface service, and they really were largely obsolete by World War II because of the development of the fast battleship, which we'll discuss a little bit more later. But in essence, the battle cruiser was a cruiser, just a further evolution of the armored cruiser. And when I said that the Scharnhorst was the last class of German armored cruiser, I kind of lied. I kind of fibbed there. It was the last traditional armored cruiser class. But there was another armored cruiser class between the, Scharn, or between the Scharnhorst and Germany's first battle cruiser, uh, the Fond du Tan. Uh, and that was the SMS Blücher, uh, which was... The British classified the Blücher as a battle cruiser, but in fact it was an armored cruiser. The Blücher gives proof to the argument that the battle cruiser was in fact just a development of the armored cruiser. Just a... You know, a larger, better-armed armored cruiser. 
The Blucher was a response to the first British battle cruisers, and therefore the British kind of considered it a battle cruiser on its own. But it was not. Uh, what it was was a very large armored cruiser uh, that was superior to the German pre-dreadnoughts, but quite inferior to any of the dreadnoughts or battle cruisers that it would face in World War I. It was kind of a ship without a class, almost. The Blucher had 12 8.3-inch guns, so you know a further in increase over what the um, what the Scharnhorst had, uh, but it also uh, was in a better um, configuration and twin turrets rather than some of the kind of single gun and swivel mounts on the Scharnhorst. Additionally, the Blucher was about 16,000 tons, so almost the same size as the Edward VII class British pre-dreadnoughts. Its broadside weight was 2,800 pounds, uh, which again was over 600 pounds heavier than the German uh, battleships at the time. I think it was still lighter than the uh, the Edward VII, if you include its secondary batteries. But nonetheless, a very powerful main armament uh, and a very large and well-armored ship uh, that was faster than German pre-dreadnoughts as well. So it's sort of fitting into this cruiser vein. It, it had a speed of about 25 knots, uh, which was slower than the British battle cruisers that it would face off against, uh, however, uh, faster than any of the pre-dreadnought battleships, and actually I think faster than the uh, Nassau-class German dreadnoughts as well, the first German dreadnoughts. So the Blucher's kind of this in-between child. It kind of gives proof to the idea that the battle cruiser is really just a further development of the armored cruiser. So if we're going to say that battle cruisers should not have existed or that it was a flawed concept, what we really need to do is we need to say, listen, it's not a unique concept. The battle cruiser is, in fact, just an iteration. It wasn't a revolutionary design. It, it was taking the lessons of the HMS Dreadnought, which was the first all-big gun battleship. You know, the HMS Dreadnought was when uh, Sir John Fisher said, listen, we're not going to have these mixed battleships. We're not going to have battleships with only four 12-inch guns and, you know, six 9-inch guns and, you know, 10 4-inch guns. What we're going to do is we're just going to put all of our weight, all of our armor, we're going to put it all, all of our armament, into four or five turrets, you know, it's going to be 10, 12 inch guns. You know, get rid of that middle battery, you know, that's heavy and eating up space. Let's just have 10, 12 inch guns for our main armament. And, um, you know, we'll introduce steam turbines as well to help power these ships so that they'll be a little bit faster than preceding battleships. Not noticeably, but a little bit. And it's taking that concept, that, you know, heavy, single caliber warship and uh, introducing it and carrying it over into the cruiser concept. Okay, instead of having, you know, four eight-inch guns and six five-inch guns and, you know, this mixed battery, let's go out there and let's have 12 8.3-inch guns. Or in the British case, let's have, I think it was 10 uh, 12-inch guns on our first battleship, our battle cruisers. Maybe it was eight. Um, so let's have just the standard heavy armament, uh, similar armor layout to armored cruisers, but it'd be bigger, it'll be faster, it's going to use turbines, and it will replace and, and it will supersede all cruisers before it. But it's not a new ship, it's not a new concept. It's taking what HMS Dreadnought did for the battleship and carrying it over to the cruiser. So the battle cruiser... Uh, dictum, calling it a battle cruiser is in fact a disservice to it. What it really is, is a cruiser, an armored cruiser, maybe a fast armored cruiser, or a modern armored cruiser, but it's not something totally different. So, I didn't intend to ramble for 30 minutes about the history of the cruiser before we got into the actual discussion of the battle cruiser and its use and its obsolescence or, you know, not being obsolescent. Um, however, obviously I've done that. It's been 29 minutes. So I hope this was enjoyable and entertaining. Um, you can let me know in the comments and descriptions if it was or if it was not. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this up. So I'm going to have another video that will come out sometime in the future that will talk more specifically about the battle cruiser. Because uh, what this video really was, was a history of the armored cruiser. And um, while I think it was, well, I hope it was, uh, entertaining and enjoyable, um, I also am under no illusion that it was much longer than it probably needed to be or should have been. 
So we'll leave off there uh, with the evolution of the armored cruiser and kind of the groundwork, at least men, you know, mentally speaking, laid for the battle cruiser. And we'll come back another time and we'll talk about the battle cruisers themselves, their designs, what they were used for. If that was any different than what we just talked about for the armored cruiser. And we'll have an assessment, which I think you already know where I'm going with it. But you know, we'll have an assessment of the actual capabilities of the ship and how they fared. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts in the descriptions. I appreciate you tuning in. Um, this was a little bit more formulaic, but again, still long-winded than I usually do. Um, but let me know your thoughts. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, guys, and I'm out. <laughs>